Good afternoon and welcome to a sweltering Sabi Sands Game Reserve. I've just hit my first traffic jam of the afternoon. You can barely see it, but there is a massive male elephant hiding behind the bush. I'm just trying to be careful. We found a big must bull this morning out on drive and I don't want to surprise him. Hello big boy. Now, remember this is 100% live, so this is unplanned. You never know what you're going to find on a live safari. My name is Brent Yeosmith, and for the first time in about six months, I'm reunited with the Wildebeest. Uh, so, very exciting to be back on drive with Wilde. And, of course, we have some very, very special Safari Live fans that, oh, that are in final control. So... A big hello to them, and I'm sure a lot of you know who they are. Hashtag Safari Live, if you can guess which Safari Live fans are sitting in final control right now. Remember, if you can send us questions as well, once you've finished guessing uh, on the hashtag Safari Live uh, as well, just pop it on any of the feeds that you might be watching on. So I'm trying to get towards Hosanna, uh, the young male leopard who we left at the end of drive quite close to here this morning. But this Eddie is a little bit close to the road for me to go shooting past him. And I'm just trying to see if it is the same big must bull we saw this morning. Now, a little clue to which Safari Live viewers are sitting in final control. They might be on Safari at Chitwa Chitwa, and they might have my little brother as their Safari Guide. Even the elephant's listening. He started keeping still. I'm just going to try and maneuver us into a slightly better position uh, without getting too close to him. Uh, ooh, but he's obviously chosen the most difficult spot for us to get around. Oh, watch out. There we go. Oh, this looks like he might be having a snooze against that tree. He looks like he's been here all day. And it's not, is it the must ball? What do you do? He was, look at that, he's resting his face on that branch. Now, what is he doing actually? I can't really see what he's doing. But he's being, oh dear. Okay, and uh, uh, VMP, that's, so it looks like he's actually, um, so guys, this is, quite a, a possibly dangerous situation so I'm just going to move the car into a, a place that I can escape if I need to be. It looks like he's quite badly injured um, from it looks like the size of that injury it looks like he tangled with another big elephant and uh, a t it looks like a tusk puncture something's pulled out a lot of his insides so this is quite a serious injury and that's why he was probably trying to rest his head up on that on that tree. Okay, so shame, boy. Now we can't really see what's going on on the other side, um, but that looks very, very serious from this side. Uh, he's not showing any or displaying any aggression at all towards us um, at the moment, but you can see him leaning against that tree. Uh, to try to take the weight off the, his injured left side. Shame, big guy. Now, male elephants, when they do fight, can, it can be very, very serious. And it looks like he's probably been injured by a, a big tusk. And it's pulled through. Now, animals, of course, are incredibly resilient. And they can sometimes come back from what we consider to be absolutely horrific injuries. So, what I need to do now is I need to get hold of the Sabi Sands quickly 
um, just because an injured male elephant like this uh, can be a potential uh, threat to people on safari and if he gets close to safari lodges so we just need to inform someone and uh, I'm going to do that quickly while we do that let's go across to Taylor so she can say good afternoon Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Sunset Safari again. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me, I'm very lucky, is David. I just wanted to make it awkward for him. Right, now as most of you know, you can chat to us and ask us all sorts of questions. All you have to do is hashtag Safari Live and uh, you can talk to us via the YouTube chat too. Very sad about that elephant. But like Brent said, it can be quite dangerous, especially if we are around doing bushwalks. That is an animal you do not want to bump into. Now, are we ready? We're heading to the Birmingham boys that we had this morning, or that Brent got this morning. And then we revisited a little bit later on in the drive. So that's where we're going now. I suspect they're going to be flat still, but we'll have a little look at them and then maybe go and look for something else and come back a bit later. So, for all of you diehard Safari Live fans out there, you know you can come and visit us, right? You come to the Sabi Sands, you come and stay around, you come and see us. And well, we've got Matt and Lisa sitting in final control today having a little watch and uh, I just wanted to make a public announcement thank you very much for the chocolates and the apple juice and the coffee we're very excited to have you with us we wish you, with us. We wish you could stay longer so actually I have, a, I have a question then for Matt and Lisa sitting in final control do you have any questions for us how cool is that instead of having to type away you can just ask a question. Oh, there's actually, David, hold on tight. But have they already drank? There's a whole herd of elephants that have just gone past the dam cam. You may have seen them. I didn't see them. I didn't know they were there. But we'll try and catch up to them. I think there's a sneaky road down here. An old two track that I used when I, we had Hukumuri. Excuse me, Impala, coming through. <clears throat> Hello, Impala, making all sorts of strange noises. Um, oh, no, you know what they're going to do? They're going to be so sneaky. I know exactly where they're going to come out. They're going to go feed in this thicket. So we shall reposition quickly. Sorry, everybody. We'll try and get a view of the elephants. But they're going down, basically past the lodges now, past Veritella. And as we drive along, though, speaking of elephant bulls and musts, and Brent had obviously an interesting sighting this morning. Megan, you've asked... Um, how exactly do elephants come into mass? Well, they just start producing a lot of uh, testosterone um, at certain times of uh, the year and at a certain age. That, again, there's a lot of factors that um, will determine when an elephant bull comes into mast. But essentially what's going on is that there, there's an overload of testosterone being produced, being re not reproduced, being produced in their bodies. And um, it basically causes them to go a bit wild. They become very excited, and all they want to do is chase after the females. They basically have blinkers on, and they don't even acknowledge anyone else around them, unless you drive behind the elephant bull and mass and, and sort of bother them. Then they're going to turn around and go, well, I told you I didn't want you to drive right behind me. I think before we get to these lions, we're going to try and anticipate. Wait, hold on, everybody. That's a bumpy section of the road. We're going to try and and then hopefully we'll get to see them because there were quite a few of them some of you may have been watching on the on the dam cam in fact uh, there's a massive animal pathway that runs in line with the the rooms of Vuyatela and come all the way it comes all the way up here the thing is, is that I don't like to offer it for elephants because I think it's dangerous because if something goes wrong you can't really get out very quickly at least if we've got the rows and things So we are, that's the plan, and um, we just wait for them. And here's a particularly thick area. So I think there seem to be a few bulls and must around on the property that could have been bothering these breeding herds. So we don't want to bother them anymore. Just having a look. Actually, what we might do is I might just pull off here and we'll stop and listen quickly. Maybe we can hear them. That's what I'm going to do. I feel 
like these elephants are tiptoeing through the bush. Hmm. Now I can't hear any cracking of branches just yet. Are they still down at the dam? Did they maybe turn around and go towards Buyatella Dam itself? Anyways, I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't sound like anybody's been able to spot them. They've gone sort of further north. Okay, well, we'll just wait patiently. There's only a couple of uh, animal pathways that I think that they would use. They will get them eventually. Tristan is going to be on bushwalk for a little bit, so off you go and join him. We are indeed, we are going to be on bushwalk and that is why we are a little bit tardy this afternoon. So as Taylor mentioned, my name is Tristan. On camera I've got a Craig, aka the Batman, and we're hopefully going to have a wonderful afternoon. It's a warm, very, very hot day, and so it should be good conditions for walk. We should have a few insects around, hopefully moving about, maybe even some butterflies. I've already seen a couple monarchs floating about, so we'll maybe see if we can concentrate on some butterflies. And anything else that comes our way, we're going to try and see if we can go. And the reason why we... Like like I say, on foot is because Jigger has a problem where it overheats a little bit and so the sound then goes and so we're waiting for Jigger to cool down. So we'll jump into Jigger a little bit later when it gets a little cooler but for now we're going to be on foot. I did have some audio for some elephants not too far away. Very close. Sounds like actually just at the dam itself. So maybe what we're going to do is try and head down that section and see if we can find those ellies and have a little look at them on foot and then otherwise anything else we can see. Now while we try and get everything sorted out and try and get ourselves down to that area let's send you back across to Brent and see where he is and what his plans are so far now that he's left that elephant. Hey guys I'm just warning everyone this this is not the nicest view around so if you are sensitive you might not want to look so I, I've reported, I'm just waiting for a call back um, from the wardens and stuff and you can see there quite obviously that it's a tusk wound from another elephant so it, is, it isn't from human beings but um, you can see the wound is quite serious and you can just see that from his behavior now uh, you can see there's even a stick stuck in there so I mean this looks relatively recent within the, within the last couple of days and uh, shame he must be in so much pain so it'll be up to the sabi sands to decide what to do i've just got to wait here to uh till i hear back from them and if they need gps coordinates and things like that no it is that does look quite bad shame and he's showing no sign of aggression or anything like that he's just resting up against this uh, weeping wattle tree So he keeps throwing sand on the wound and what he's doing there is trying to keep the flies off it. Now of course that injury is quite bad but he, he doesn't look too weak just yet. So the predators are possibly could take advantage of this and that's what Matt's wondering. Uh, will, will lions take advantage of this elephant? There is a strong possibility. Depending on how weak he is, hyenas as well would definitely... I've seen hyenas harass injured ellies before uh, for up to two days before actually managing to kill the elephant. So it is one of those difficult things. But that is nature and that's how nature plays out day after day. Uh, when we're not watching, so one must remember that. that we are observers here, and we're not here to interfere. Romit, it's such a difficult question you're asking, Romit, about if the animal is endangered, will they interfere? You saw what happened with that wild dog. Um, they didn't interfere. So if the injury is deemed to be caused by human beings by some way, then the vets will sometimes interfere and uh, try heal it. Um, but most of the time in these situations, uh, nothing will happen. The, uh, if they do decide to interfere with this elephant, it's, it's it's difficult to say what will happen, but they just need to know about it because it is a potential 
uh, safety risk to all of us out here. I mean, bushwalks and other game drive vehicles. Um, and if he wanders close to camps and he's injured and trying to get water or food. So that's why I've notified people he is a potential safety risk. Um, I wonder if it was that must bull we saw this morning. That That is something a big must bull like that might do to a, a younger bull like this. While in must, not necessarily when they're out of must, but when in must, that is something that massive must bull we had on the Sunrise Safari might do. Now, Ronda's asking about the age of this Eddie. He's old. Uh, he's not. He's not a very old bull. I'd say he's probably around thirty. So he is an adult. Um, oh shame! Anyway, he's throwing dirt on that wound again. And it's quite bad. You can actually see there's a little. It looks like an acacia stick that's got actually stuck in some of the tattered flesh there. So, as I say, it's quite fresh, and at the moment he might not be a problem, but if infection sets in, he could become a very dangerous animal here. So, uh, whether the, the ch choice is made to leave him, um, or euthanize, or treat, I'm glad I'm not the one who has to make those decisions. And uh, we've had quite a close look at the injury. And Bobby's wondering, is it just skin or intestines? It actually looks to be pieces of intestine, Bobby. Um, so when we first saw him hiding behind the tree, I just thought he was having a snooze. And as we moved around, I could actually, I just got that smell of stomach. So it, the, the chances of it getting infected are very, very high. Especially since it's dangling like that, if he moves through the bush, it could get tangled on, on stuff as you've seen there. I'm just going to move a little bit forward. Shame, big boy. Okay, there, Vian. Now, as I said, the, what happens to him, uh, I'm glad I'm not the one who has to make those decisions. But uh, JK is asking if he's euthanized, um, will he be euthanized if he passed? There's uh, a danger towards the safari vehicles and stuff like that. Again, it's not, not my place to answer those questions, JK, but I think. Um, uh, a careful decision will be made. Oh, it looks like there's just a fresh bout of blood coming out now. Something moved. Uh, you can on the back right side. It's a. I just suddenly saw a little gush of blood coming out. There we go. And as I said, if you are sensitive, this is not for you. Um, we we're not going to be here the whole afternoon. I'm just waiting to hear back from um, the authorities. And as soon as I've heard back from them, I will be leaving. Um, I just need to know whether they need GPS locations and things like that. It doesn't look like he's going to move anyway. It looks like he's been here for quite a long time. Now... Of course, seeing stuff like this is difficult, and Emma is asking, does it ever get easier? Emma, I should hope not. I mean, uh, to a degree, we are immune to certain things. Uh, well, more immune than people who don't deal with it on a daily basis. But it's never nice to see anything suffering, um, animal or human. So if you get too used to it, I'd say there's probably something wrong with you. Shame. 
So he's just been moving around this tree throughout the whole day. I can see from the tracks he's flattened the area. Um, and he just can't seem to get comfortable. You, know, you can just see how he's been there kicking up the dirt, spraying the dust on that wound. Oh, sorry, um, I need to answer the phone quickly. So, next, if you need to link away, can you please do it? Okay, cross to Taylor. Hello. Hello again, everybody. We got our elephants out. I think it was fantastic, by the way. It was really quite nice. I've been searching for a herd of elephants for I cannot tell you how long. Most of you know. Sorry I didn't get to share it with all of you. Uh, I'm trying to think what we're going to do now. It was very cute. It was a tiny little baby. But maybe some of you were lucky enough to get to see it on the damn cam. Um, I'm not going to go to the Birmingham Mails because I know they're going to be fast asleep. So we'll probably come back a bit later. And I suppose we'll just drive around and see what we can find. Maybe do some birding. So that's going to be the plan for now. Maybe we'll head on over to Chitwa. We'll have a little look a bit later. Mm. Actually, let's go this way because there's some nice mud wallows down here. Actually, we'll go around here. So I don't, I don't know. We're going to just try to find some more elephants because I'd like to spend a bit of time with them as I haven't spent much time with them at all. Just that nice bull that decided to stay for like two seconds this morning, have a, had a quick mud bath and then continued chasing after that young cow and calf that were there before him. Speaking of elephants, roadblock. Right, where's the road that I'm looking for? Hopefully we'll be able to find some elephants and then we can have lots and lots and lots of chats about them. But uh, it seems that we're just doing a DNC at the moment. Jason, you've asked how long does must last with elephants? Um, it depends. Again, some it can last for up to two weeks, some it might last a week. I suppose it just depends on their, their age and sort of social status, perhaps if they're a very big strong bull that's in prime condition it can last for a little bit longer than others some coming around a week or two i thought i saw a leopard tracks it wasn't a leopard track in fact it was just a hyena footprint ski hyena there's some mud wallows down the Oh, sorry everyone, I'm eating ice, <laughs> it's very hot, just under 100 Fahrenheit, so we're busy still formulating a plan, um, I'm just waiting for another phone call, um, should be, I hopefully won't be here longer than another 10 or 15 minutes um, while we get the right people on the way, so as I said, the, the biggest danger with this Ellie is not now, uh, while it's quite fresh still, um, it's in a day or two when it gets in, in if it gets infected with with intestines and stuff it probably will um, He could become very aggressive and uh, take it out on all sorts of things uh, including vehicles bushwalks lodges um, housekeeping ladies while they're collecting um, stuff like that So at the moment he is nice and relaxed, but he is a, a potential danger uh, down the road a little bit Ludmila was asking, is there any chance that Eddie could have got better? And I was sort of umming and ahhing, but then he defecated and uh, his dung came out runny and full of blood. So you see there, Vyampi. So it wasn't the normal blop, blop that you hear from an elephant. It, 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 yeah, so it, it just sort of shot out. And I could see specks of blood in it, which, as I say, is not a good sign. And it means he's, he's wounded quite badly somewhere in the digestive tract. So th there's... <laughs> if, I, if I'm honest with everyone here, there's, there's very, very little chance of survival for this elephant. Um, and so that wound probably happened last night or yesterday. 
Um, although it's very difficult to tell, especially with these Eddie Bulls, because they keep throwing dust all over the wounds. Shame, big boy. Now, unfortunately, this is one of those realities about living out in the bush. That sometimes it isn't all strawberries and cream. Now, if we, we take a positive from this elephant dying, this elephant has died will die from a natural cause and a wound from fighting with another elephant bull. Uh, Coast Rinder is asking what animals will eat it. Now that's the positive that if this elephant does die it does provide a huge amount of um, food and nutrition back to the bush. Lai, I've seen lions, hyenas, I've even seen leopard feed off dead elephant um, but most it'll be lions and hyenas and apart from that um, apart from the lions and hyenas, um, the beetles, the, the, the carrion beetles, the scarab beetles, the dung beetles, um, flies, maggots, a whole host of other insects. So, I mean, it's, his, his legacy will be putting back to the earth in terms of nutrients and, and food for other animals. So at the moment he's trying not to move too much but he can't help himself um sorry guys i need to take the call so, so now. hello Okay, so, um, Nikki, are we still having tech problems with other vehicles? Um, so I do need to be on the phone for quite a bit. Okay, it sounds like Taylor has moved out of, uh, or fixed her gremlins or moved into a good signal area. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappear for a little bit to try sort out everything about this elephant and hopefully we'll be back a little bit later with Hosanna. Well, we'll see how long our signal lasts for as we are heading to some other areas now. So I'm just showing these guys that I'm live and I can't stop and have a chat. Um, I'm sure they're going to go and look for Hosanna, but I'm not going to go and look for Hosanna now because I know that Brent would like to look for Hosanna. So we shall go down this way. We're just going to drive up and down on some roads with lots of mud wallows and hopefully find the elephants because that's what I'd like to do. I think it's going to be too hot for the cats to be doing anything right now. I mean, the weather was 36 degrees Celsius. It's warm. It doesn't actually feel that hot. Eh? It's warm, but it's not, not too bad. Nice with a breeze. Gentle breeze still continuing from this morning, so that's quite nice and refreshing. That's why we want to keep on the go or stop in the shade. We don't want to be stopping in the in the sun at all. Not on a day like today. There's actually not that many birds out. Maybe we'll have a good chance of watching some birds splish and splash around in the water, but not now, as everything is hiding away from us at the moment. Which seems to be about normal. <laughs> So we're looking. I'm looking for anything that's moving in these bushes. Ooh, and maybe should keep my eyes on the road at some point too. All that rain that we had, even though it was nice soaking rain, um, we've had a couple of roads that don't like the rain very much caused erosions. So 
some of the roads need to be regraded again. And I'm pretty sure when Rexon is back, Rexon is coming back, when is he coming back? Wednesday, I think. I'm pretty sure in between drives he'll be back at it again in his big tractor, perhaps dragging tires or first scraping the roads. Checking the trees, anybody sitting in the branches? No. Right, well, we'll try our luck. Maybe we'll have to go into the Mulwati, perhaps catch some elephants that side. Or if you go to Tristan, who's got something that flaps its wings pretty quickly. I do indeed. Now it's bouncing around all over this plant and making it a little difficult to see, but it is a butterfly. I was saying that there is noticeably more butterflies flying around today, and I'm just trying to ID exactly which one. It looks like maybe a dusky copper. That's what it looks like. I'm just waiting for it to open its wings, or oh, now it's flying again. I was hoping that it would just do a little open for me that we'd see it. So it keeps going away and then landing back on this plant, so we're just going to wait for it. There we go. It's now landed once again in the same spot, and it's opening every now and then and giving gives a little bit of orange tinge, so it does look like a little dusky copper. It's over here. Greg, Greg, you can see it over there. So, I know there's lots of grass in your way. I'll try and get that rid of that. Have you got it there, Greg? And lots of wind as well, which is not ideal. So, a lot of butterflies already flying around. Like I said, I've seen this guy. I've seen... Some of the little spotted blues, I saw a citrus swallowtail, monarch, even some of the acreas are around as well. So it should be a good afternoon for butterflies. Hopefully what's going to happen is we're going to get a bit of a wind and the wind will then settle down and it will cool off a bit. And then these butterflies should stop from flying around and will make it a lot easier. There we go, Craig, it's not actually even closer to you. So, But it is bouncing around all over the place, which is not making life ideal at all for poor Craig. Craig's having to bounce around on different plants all over the place. But isn't it beautiful? with those little spots and stripes and markings and then when it opens its wings it's more brown on top with a little orange section so i'll just double check exactly which one it is but i'm pretty sure it's one of the coppers i'll just have to double check exactly which copper oh, sorry craig that's my fault i've dropped a piece of grass and <laughs> fly past craig's face but just, they'll be out because there'll be a number of plants that are flowering and with the bit of rain that we had and now a little sunshine you're going to have perfect conditions for butterflies to go and get all the nectar out of and pollen out of these plants and be able to actually feed on it. Now apparently you can see it's a proboscis going into the plants and actually f feeding off that nectar which is very very cool. It's not every day that you can see that. Now in terms of the difference between moths and butterflies you can see how this insect keeps its wings closed for the most part and it's very very active now during the day. A moth is far more active during the night and when it lands it will land with its wings down and flattened against its body. Also, if you look at these guys, they have club-like antenna, so very thin antenna with a little sort of soiling end to it, whereas moths tend to have a feather-like antenna that gives them a little bit of a difference between the butterflies. So if you're wondering how they kind of work and what the difference is between the two, then that is it. <coughs> But very, very cool. Excuse me. Sorry, I was just coughing there a little bit. It seems as though there's a lot of insects out here. I'm actually just looking around. A lot of buzzing about and lots of flies and all kinds of other things. So hopefully we'll see lots of different types of things. Now, sorry, Nick, if you can just repeat the first part of that question. I heard it turns into butterflies, but I didn't get the first part. Ooh, so David, what percentage of cocoons turns into butterflies? That's a difficult thing to say. I think it depends on different areas. I would imagine that some areas there's a lot more predation than there is in others. I mean, if you look at out here, there's going to be huge amounts of animals that will predate on poor little caterpillars that are going into a chrysalis to start kind of hatching. So I actually wouldn't be sure as to what to say to that. I, I know last year, though, we had a fallen over tree with the creas that went up and at one point I think there was about 12 chrysalis on there and after about a week there was only one still dangling so if you go on that you'll have you know a very 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 small percentage but it, it depends I think it depends on the area that you're in the amount of predators that are around how well they've concealed themselves when they go into that state and they then start to kind of go through a metamorphosis it's going to be interesting I, I honestly have no idea what the percentage would be in a system like this. I think we would have a, you know, it would be something that we'd have to kind of monitor and you'd have to get a sample size and then try and work it out amongst them. Right, let's carry on, Craig. Let's see what else we can find. 
Ah, Patrick, you're asking if I have a favorite butterfly. I don't know if I have a favorite individual butterfly, but I do have a favorite in terms of a family of butterflies. So my favorite butterflies that we see, well there's actually two. One is the Shiraxes family. So the Shiraxes family for me are absolutely beautiful. Um, there's one called the Fox Shiraxes, which is a very, very cool name. And then also the Swallowtails. So things like the Citrus Swallowtail are absolutely beautiful. They've got vivid colors, quite large butterflies, and they've got these little tail streamers that come down. So those two families are really my favorites um, and the ones that I like to see the most. I, there are others that are quite difficult to find around here that in certain other parts of South Africa you can see that maybe are, would be on that list but those are the two kind of families and, and particularly here in, in this part of the world I would say probably the Foxy Shiraxes and the Citrus Swallowtail are my two favorites that we see. Hopefully we'll be able to find either one of those this afternoon. It'll be quite nice. Like I said I did see a Swallowtail fly past us just now and so while I go looking for them and seeing if we can find them let's hand you over back to Brent who I think has left that poor elephant and is carrying on on his way and let's see what he's going to be up to. So welcome back guys, I know a lot of you would prefer to stay there and stuff like that but at the moment I don't want to add any pressure on that animal. The Sabi sands are en route, um, I will go back and take them there a little bit later in the drive. So for the moment let's see if we can find our little prince. This is where we left him this morning and I said with Hasana it's unlikely that he's lying in the same spot during the day. He likes to cruise around and he is not there. So he was lying at the base of that little bush there this morning so he's not there. There's no tracks of him heading down towards that elephant which is probably more, most sensible for him because I think that Ellie would take most unkindly to the presence of any predators at this very moment. But I'm going to just check some of the other bits of shade around here. You might have moved a little bit uh, during the day. I'm just seeing if the other game drive vehicles tracks head off a little bit. So what we're doing is, is that him there? Or oh, are my eyes playing tricks on me? Let's have a quick look. Oopsie. I swear I saw spots in this thicket. But I think I've got spots on the brain. Uh, okay, well, I try to figure out where her son has gone. Oh no, you're staying with me. It seems like the gremlins are out in force today. The Birmingham boys are back on the property and child of the universe is asking what, how far away from this injured elephant. They're actually quite far. Uh, we're down towards the southeast of uh, Juma and the Birmingham's are up in the north, uh, the northwest sort of. Afternoon Henry, um, no updates just yet. Uh, Batalier Road is zoned um, due to an injured elephant bull, so please stay clear of that area. Uh, no sign of a sign yet, we're trying to follow up, but uh, till the Sabi Sands has come to have a look at the Eddy, uh, Batalier is zoned. Okay, we're just checking all the little spots of shade. Where is Hassan at? Uh, I might do a little loop onto the road, see if his tracks come out. But in the meantime, let's go see where Madam McCurdy is heading to next. Well, Brain, you won't believe who we just spotted very briefly. It was that big tusker that was uh, chasing you around this morning. He's basically between Mumba Road and Drakensberg. And he's, I think, I'm hoping he's following a breeding herd because that's a breeding herd I'd like to try and find. So we can't get to the elephant, of course, because he is in the middle of the thicket and you all know I don't off-road for elephants, especially not a must bull. <laughs> Never. So we're going to just drive around here, but I'm just checking carefully in the thickets. It's so easy with this long grass and big trees to miss a fully grown elephant, even to miss 30 elephants. And I would think that he's trying to find breeding herds, especially if he is in must, like we were talking about earlier. 
he's basically just going to be driven by his testosterone at the minute. So he'll be munching along the way, but he'll be marching, marching constantly, trying to pick up a scent on a group of females. Oh, there's Brent. Actually, <laughs> let's go say hello to Brenty. I'll tell him that his friend is coming to find him. Perhaps that's what, maybe that's what that elephant is doing. Hi, Brent. Your friend, the elephant must bull, is on his way to you. On his way to you. Do you think he's giving him a hiding? Mm, there's Brent. Brent's on the radio. Let's watch how Brent operates the radio from... <laughs> So he's trying to follow tracks. I'm actually going to turn around because I don't want to squash any of Hosanna's tracks. Maybe we'll go down towards Chitwa. So this is the area Brent is working. So Brent might even find that herd of elephants. But like Brent said, perhaps that big fella has already given another young bull a hiding. And we were talking about this the other day, in fact, where um, we had that very, well, rowdy young elephant bull um, playing with another elephant bull. And if a big tusker like that came across that young fella being cheeky, he may meet the same, well, might go down the same road and tusk him. That happens quite often, in fact. Very sad for that elephant, though. Very, very sad. But I don't think there's much you can do if its intestines are hanging out. <sighs> Not great at all. <laughs> now, for those of you who haven't met Daryl the elephant, who's my favorite elephant, he roams around on the Sabi sand. He spends most of his time down at Earth Lodge at Sabi Sabi. Um, he's that elephant with a bell shape in his ear. Or well, the Snapchat symbol, some of you have said. Looks like the little ghost. And Senek, you've asked if this testosterone makes elephants a little bit cheekier. Most certainly it does. And Daryl's a prime example of it. Whenever he comes up and causes havoc, he's normally in mast. But um, he, it's like he enjoys the vehicles and causing trouble with them. And it's quite funny because that was like one of David's first elephant encounters. Interesting. And he had been working in the bush at all, huh? Came straight from the city <laughs> and then met Daryl with Scott. <laughs> So yeah, and he's not a small elephant either. So, so yes, it does, Sinek, you're quite right. It, um, it indeed makes them cheekier. So you've just got to be wary of them and give them a bit of room and, uh, and just, well, watch them. Sometimes they're fine. Sometimes they just carry on with their day. I, I don't like, particularly like viewing elephant bulls and mice just because I've had some not-so-nice encounters with them, which I've told you all about. But yeah, anyways, it seems as though Tristan might be stomping around. Perhaps it's because he's got ants in his pants. I hopefully won't have this many ants in my pants because otherwise I'll be very uncomfortable. But we basically have been looking around and there's so much insect life after the rain that we decided we'll have a little look under a fallen over log just to see what's happening. And there's just a myriad of ants going absolutely crazy so they're all over this tree and they're moving around they're coming out and they're kind of streaming up and down there's a whole bunch on the ground as also well. i feel a little bit bad that we moved it so we'll put it back nicely just now but it's amazing to see how many are here there must be hundreds of thousands of ants going up and down utilizing this old dead tree as a way to be safely housed and to be able to hide away from various predators that might be out here you'll find that's why things like even odd fox sometimes will try and break towards these kind of dead trees and dig underneath and try and then get to all of this that is moved on. You can actually see that some of them are busy carrying eggs um, out of the actual area and moving them around. In fact, I'm not even sure these are ants, some of them. Some of them might even be termites. There's an interesting one that's kind of going along, which is this individual over here, and it's moving very fast. Oh, no, it's gone and hidden. But there was a really large one that was in amongst them that was moving quite quickly, and it almost looked a little termite-like. And what could be happening is sometimes you'll have termites in these kind of trees like this, and the ants actually raid them, and they try and kind of take the eggs and actually even carry off some of the termites as well. Ants are ferocious predators. They're amazing things to watch. But it also looks like some of them, I'm just trying to have a little look because it's difficult to see, but there's little eggs that are actually being carried as well by these ants. So there's some of them are picking up little egg larvae, and they're now moving them along deeper into the actual um, 
depths of this tree to try and just hide them out away a little bit better. So I'm not going to actually spend too long here because obviously we've disturbed their nest a little bit. So I want to put it back nicely. But before we do that, what you will find is also over here is that we've got a very interesting situation. There you've got a carapace for a dung beetle by the looks of things. Now what that could indicate is two things. Either the dung beetle, when it was very, very soft, decided to kind of lay its last egg in this area and bury its little ball if it was one of those that does bury balls. Or there's a situation where there might have been a scorpion living in this particular tree. And so as we have these kind of dead trees, you'll find lots of scorpions live inside here, particularly a scorpion called Pisticanthus asper. And they spend a lot of time kind of moving around in dead trees, and they'll hunt various insects from there. And so what it might have done is actually caught it, fed off it, and then this is just the exoskeleton that is now left after the scorpion has fed, which is pretty crazy. So, no, it's very difficult to say how many ants are in each colony. As you can see here, counting this many ants is nearly impossible. One, because they are moving so fast. Two, because there's just literally so many that you'll be here probably for the next 10 weeks trying to count all of these ants. So, difficult to say. I would say that there must be easily thousands within this particular colony because it's not only here that there's a lot of movement. There's a whole bunch of movement on the ground as well. So, there's literally ants all over the place here. You can see where Craig is sitting. Uh, the ground is literally crawling with ant species that are moving around. So, there's far too many for, for us to count and to know exact numbers. Also, the way that they go back and forth to individually know which ant you've counted and which one you haven't would make it very difficult. You'd probably have a situation where you'd have far too many ants to that you'd recount. Now, Nicole, don't... ...is incapacitated. Oh, my goodness. Sorry about that, everybody. Tristan... Did the ants get him? Perhaps they, because he said he hopes he doesn't get ants in his pants. Maybe they crawled on in there and he had to stomp around. I don't know what just happened there. Um, so we're driving down Cheetah Cut Line now, looking. Still looking for a herd of elephants. I wonder how long it's going to take me now. Shall we play a game on how long will it take Taylor to find a herd of elephants? I think it's going to be another three game drives. So this afternoon, I think by tomorrow afternoon or the following morning, I might put a herd of elephants on screen, we'll see. We have to start the counter again. <laughs> and, oh, I see some impala up ahead. We can go and have a look at them. Maybe they'll want to stay around. We'll quickly check here for Tingana. I should probably ask the guides if anybody's relocated on Tingana, as soon as I'm approaching the area. Let me do that. Sheldon, Sheldon, can you copy me? Let me just chat to Sheldon quickly. Huh? Dylan, Dylan for Taylor. Maybe they're not even in the east anymore. Oh, I just can't hear them. Also a possibility. Who's shouting in here? Oh, there's ho those ho there. The fighting hornbills. There we go. So cool. Listen to them. Very chatty. <laughs> Look at the way they run. Why are you wearing long pants? It's a hot day. They are quite warm too. They're very chatty, these two. Flying around looking for beetles and all sorts of other things that may be crossing the road. What is it doing? The other one's coming in to join it. Now oh, they're done. Did you catch something? No? No caterpillars? I always enjoy watching hornbills feast, but now you can see. Sadly, not successful, but we'll just give the beak a good clean anyways. Very cool. Now I can hear the babblers. Very nice. Well, let's go down to the little pan, because I think that's where all the impala are gathering. Perhaps we're going to see Wilbur the warthog. That would be a nice surprise. Wilbur the Warthog's pan is filled up so much you won't even recognize it. He might have to be careful. He might have to wear a life jacket if he wants to go in there. Now, speaking of animals popping into the road, Avon wishes you've just asked about 
whether a leopard has ever popped onto the road uh, while I've been driving. Yeah, well, it actually happens often. A gajima does that to you, and then you normally just see his tail disappearing. Um, who else has done that? Oh, Karula's done that so many times. Oh, there's so many elephant tracks here. But they're all going this way. I think this is the breeding herd that was here. Oh, my goodness. All the impala and the sabi sand will stop here, and then they might get a, be a bit nervous for now, but I reckon they'll settle. Hello. How's it going, Impala? Where's Wilbur? Oh, this is really nice, actually. Listen to the sounds. That's all this great audio of these Impala. All very nervous, all very chatty at the edge of this pan. Now, if you have no idea who I'm talking about when I say Wilbur, Wilbur is a warthog. He's my favorite warthog. He's got no hair on the end of his tail and he's an old boy. He um, chased Gwen out of her warthog burrow, or out of the burrow in a termite mound, and then took it for his own. It was probably his first, which was quite funny. But he's a very relaxed warthog and he normally lays in the corners of the pans and he's stuck as you can drive right up to him and he doesn't run away which is quite nice because the typical sighting we get of a warthog is well their bottoms with their tails in the air impala why are you all talking so much it's like it's all the lambs are separated from their mothers and they're sort of all doing their own thing just chatting with one another supposed to keep in contact to say everything's okay all a bit nervous down at the water's edge though they don't drink for long I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I mean, an animal just doesn't keep its head down and down and down. They'll drink for a couple of seconds and then put their heads up and look around. And that's important because Tingana was not far from here. Could be a crocodile in the water. Could be a number of different things. But very nice to see so many impala. We've been having some great impala sightings. In fact, we're very lucky. We better make the most of them, of course. Off you go across to Tristan, who is having a look at some of the flora. I am indeed. I haven't seen one of these in ages, and, well, I'm so excited that we found one. It's a small little bush that we've got right in the middle of, well, just close to the dam cam, and I didn't actually know it was even here, which is very, very exciting. Now, I've got to apologize first before we carry on about our little gremlin attack we had earlier. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened there, but back to our plant. We have the most delicious-smelling tree we have out here. When you pick this and you squash it and you smell it, Mm, it smells like a lemony mint kind of smell. So it's known as Lipia javanica or fever tea. And this plant is really, really cool. It's used for a number of different things. It's a really good plant for things like asthma, if you've got coughs, if you've got any sort of blockage in your sinuses, you kind of will use this. And if, unfortunately, that elephant did die, it would have a situation where you could put this in your nose if you were going to that carcass. And all you'll smell is this lemony mint smell rather than this horrible kind of rotting meat smell. So I often used to do this with guests. Whenever we used to go to a carcass, you'd pick this and then you'd just shove it up your nose. Now, of course, you look absolutely weird when you do it. And I'll do it for you guys so that you can see. It looks really odd, but I promise you, if you've ever smelt a dead elephant, then you would know that you would do this. It will be much, much better for you. So basically, you just do something like that. Now, there we go. Do I look good? No, I'm just joking. So basically like that, and then all you smell is this really fresh kind of minty lemon smell as opposed to rotting meat. It really makes things much, much better. And I'm probably sure that most of you can't take me seriously. Craig is definitely laughing behind. Now, the other things that they use this plant for, quite interestingly enough, is it's used as a plant that they will rub on people. And they say that it keeps crocodiles away from you. So if you're ever going into an area where there's crocodile infested water, they reckon if you rub this on yourself, the oils from this will repel crocodiles. I'm not sure that that's very, very true. It's an interesting kind of thing. The other thing is also is if you have meat that has been infected with anthrax, they reckon that this plant rubbed on that meat will actually get rid of that anthrax. I'm a bit debatable about that one as well. I don't think I'd want to try and eat anything that's infected by anthrax after it's been rubbed with a plant. 
plants. But, yeah, you know, these are the things that sometimes people believe. And so it's a quite an interesting plant. The, for me, it's just the most amazing smell. And you can make a tea from a substitute from it. You kind of boil the water and you put it in and then you add milk into it. And it's actually not too bad. So it does actually taste all right. I have made tea from it before. It's not the best tea you'll ever have. It's like a green tea, but it is pretty good nonetheless. And I didn't actually know that there was one right here. So if anybody in camp has got sinus issues, this is where we need to come to be able to get it. It's a really cool smell. Now, all I can smell is mint and sort of lemony. And so... And it's a situation where it kind of feels funny now, and it's a bit of the leaf is a bit scratchy, so it makes your nose itch a little bit. So I'm going to have probably going to be have like this wiggly nose as we do the rest of the segment. Now I was busy talking about just now when we got so rudely interrupted by the gremlins. I was talking about ants swarming. So the only time we'll see ants swarming is if there's a food item. So if let's say if you're at home, you see ants and you drop maybe a sugar solution, so a sugar in water, you'll see the ants will then swarm around that in order to feed off it. But other than that, not really. Also, I suppose if they're in defense of their, their nest, then you'll find ants will kind of come in and try and defend in a big grouping. But other than that, no, not really. They just kind of go in lines and they'll go and, f and find food and they distribute out, but they don't actually swarm anything unless it's either food related or in defense of their nest that they're close to. So it's a pretty interesting thing to see. And ants are phenomenal creatures. I absolutely love them. There's actually a, a thought that if they were the size of a medium sized dog, that none of us would even be surviving because of their sort of prowess as predators. They would have a situation where they would probably just take over completely. Good. We're going to carry on. We're going to try and see what other little weird and wonderful things we can find in the open areas and see what there is. And while we do that, let's send you back across to Brent and find out whether he's had any more luck with Hosanna or if he's still with the big grey pachyderms. Well, we're back with the injured Ellie. Um, the Sabi Sands are about to arrive, so I'm just here to see what's happening next. Now, uh, we're going to just do a quick update here. Now, a herd of elephants have moved into the area as well, so he's actually surrounded by other elephants. Now, the problem is apparently that big must bull that we saw this morning. Taylor's bumped into him already this evening, and he was heading in this direction. So, it could be. A mute object if that that must pull the sides to sort of finish the job I think he's the culprit um, who, who, who perpetrated that injury I can't see him at the moment we've got a few down towards the area there now the big problem is this is the last direction um, that Hasana went so with injured elephants and must bulls around we don't really want to get out and track Hasana on foot um, so we're just just checking quickly here, and sorry, I'm just looking at that. In. I'm just making sure I can't see the big must ball just yet. You can see he's still constantly throwing dirt, dirt on the wound. Okay, well, I can see. Oh, he's starting to move now. Shame, boy. Yeah, and yeah, you can see there. It's the same Eddie. Okay, I don't want to be stuck here with the other elephants, so. Next, I gotta get out of here. So, we're we gonna send you across. Um. We don't want to be caught out in a bad position with these eddies. So I say you've got to be very careful um, when there's injuries around. Just moving out of the way. Giving them lots of space. Okay, so while we see what's happening here next, uh, let's go across to Tristan uh, to see how his bushwalk's going. Well, Brent, I think it's a good idea probably to get yourself out of the way of the Ellies and make sure that you do not get yourself squashed on Rusty. I rather like Rusty, and so I don't want to see something happen. <laughs> I'm just
getting also you as well. We don't want to see you getting yourself into danger. And so hopefully that will all play out. Now we're still just ambling about, kind of having a look, and I'm trying to look closely at all the plants because I'm sure we're going to get some cool insects after the rain that we had over the last few days with the sun, brilliant sunshine we've had since yesterday. We should have had quite a few insects starting to at least lay eggs, hatch, or be in the area. And so we're just kind of walking and trying to check and to see what we've got in this section. And it's been lots of movement, but nothing really sitting still, which is what makes it difficult in the afternoons when you're doing insect looking. And so Dale, yes, the scorpions in this area, all of them will glow under UV light, so they have a chemical within their um, within their exoskeleton called hyaline, and that hyaline reacts under UV light and you get this glowing scorpion. So what we'll try and do, I don't have a UV light with me and we're not going to be out late enough for it to be really dark to find a scorpion and actually do it, but I will try and find one somewhere along the line on one of the drives when we're out and we'll try to get a UV light and show you. But yes, the answer to that is all of our scorpions here do. Now I thought I saw some colour, I did. There we go. So there's probably one of the more colourful feathers that you get out here. It's a bit bedraggled and probably came out during the course of the rain but it's from what looks like a lilac breasted roller feather and um, you've got these beautiful beautiful um, blues purples that come across this way and then it fades into a more sort of light coloration so I would imagine this is from a lilac breasted roller if it was a purple roller we wouldn't get this brilliant electric blue here and the European rollers don't get this kind of color almost purpley blue towards the edge of the wing so from a lilac breasted roller and like I say it probably came out during the wet you can actually see the tips of the feathers are kind of bonded together and because this is not on a bird this is what would have happened if the bird was still wet and then if it grooms it with its beak and kind of goes with the beak a little bit and just sort of runs their beak through you can see the feather starts to actually gain its shape again and starts to look a lot more healthy and more feather like so that's why they preen a lot after rain is why you see them fluffed out and why they try and then run their beaks through their feathers in order just to soften everything up again and get them looking into good condition so that they can fly effectively but this would have been like I say during the rain unfortunately and that poor bird would have had to just grow another one it does happen quite regularly that they lose feathers from now and well every now and then good let's carry on Lots of interesting kind of things happening. I feel like there's a lot of growth of grass that's gotten very tall, but interestingly enough, as I'm walking around here, it's really actually not very thick. So the grass is quite sort of patchy in places. You can see lots of big gaps between the grass. So while we've been driving around at the moment and we've been moving around we've got a situation where there's kind of you think that there's a really thick carpet of grass over the last few weeks but it's actually a little bit less than you think and then once we get some really dry weather this should die down quite quickly and we'll actually see that it's quite barren still there's a lot of big gaps between the grass sort of clumps and that's going to mean a tough winter still for a lot of our animals even though the grass looks healthier and, and longer than what we've seen there still isn't that thick cover that we used to have back in the day Right, now I just heard some of the, just heard some grey go away birds alarm calling a little bit. I wonder if maybe the Wahlberg's eagles are not around. Gnome, so you're talking about a leopard that killed a cheetah today and in the Kruger Park, I gather, is where you saw that because I did see a post about it. Why would that have happened? So basically well, how that happens, and it's something that is quite common, particularly in certain parts of the Kruger, down towards actually where Hukumuri comes uh, from, Crocodile Bridge. It happens there every now and then. Then. And basically what the situation is, is that generally cheetah are going to be catching and hunting and killing something like an impala. And they're hunting in areas on the fringes of quite dense areas, or quite big thickets. And they kind of catch things in the open. And then what happens is these leopards find them there. And they rush in and they grab these cheetah and get them while they are still feeding. And they're so preoccupied with the feeding process that they don't see the leopard coming. And the leopard being a much more physical, stronger animal grabs them and then kills them. And they have a situation where they unfortunately then get you know are, are dead and then they dragged up into the tree and eaten so a leopard is a very opportunistic animal it's something that it will try its very best to try and find food all the time and, and whether that be an impala or a cheetah is irrelevant to them nutrients is nutrients and they will go after it and they will actually feed on them it's not like they're going to just put it up in the tree and leave it they will actually eat cheetah so it's a not a common common thing but it does happen quite a bit in the Kruger I think in the last few years I've seen maybe seven or eight incidents at least of leopard killing cheetah and hoisting it up into the tree and eating it so 
not a very nice thing to witness and certainly not what we want to see but that's nature it's how things go and it's the way it's gone for many many years in the past so we'll just have to you know hope that the cheetah population wherever it may be continues to grow it's been a good couple of years for cheetah in the kruger so it should be all right now we'll carry on we're going to see what else we can find i think brent's got himself out of that sticky situation and so while we carry on let's go back to him and find out what happened Sorry about that, guys. We're still busy trying to sort out the issue of this elephant. Um, the Sabi Sands I just had a chat with. Um, they have, uh, so, in theory, if, you, if anything has to be done with an elephant, it has to come with, uh, well, in Pumalanga, which is the province we're in, uh, it has to be notified to the, uh, the parks board. Sorry, guys. Standing by. So it's fine. They, they're now between Batalea and Yala Road South in that Shikova. Uh, so Spaghetti Junction, that side is fine. Station also update. Uh, Kudu alarm call. It sort of sounds like Nyala Road North Junction with um, Central Road. I'm following up. Okay, so we've zoned that area and we're not letting any other vehicles into that area. Uh, that must bull arrived while we were there looking at the injured animal. Uh, the injured animal immediately started walking towards us. That's what you saw there. We couldn't see the big must bull coming. So we've just left that area completely alone and uh, we're gonna go follow up. So while we were chatting, there were kudu alarm calling uh, directly north of where we were. So around Central Road and I'm pretty sure that's her sign out. So we're gonna go have a look in that area now. So what we'll do is we're gonna head down there, we're gonna switch off, we're gonna listen um, and see if we get any luck with uh, the little prince. So we were sitting down there, due north will be anywhere from here. So let's just turn the engine off and drift down the road. Hope to hear some of those alarm calls. So it's quite late in the afternoon, so probably nothing will be done um, about that elephant at the moment. As you can see, that the wound doesn't seem to be hampering his movement and whatnot too long. Uh, or too much but th the problem is it's not now while the wounds fresh it's once the stiffness sets in and uh, especially because it's a gut wound in a in five days or four days time when it's incredibly infected and that animals in a huge amount of pain it will become incredibly aggressive and that's where that elephant might be a possible problem so we'll wait to hear back from uh, MTPA which is the, the government body and I'm pretty sure they'll be sending someone out here tomorrow morning to try to follow up. I don't think that elephant is going to move too far from that area and but unfortunately we will not be doing any elephant tracking on foot while we're uh, I mean but leopard tracking on foot while we've got all of that over there so let's hope Hasana is deciding to be kind to us this afternoon and stays close to the road so I don't have to go walking. In the meantime let's go see where Madame McCurdy is. Heading back to camp. <laughs> this seems to be like a common trend these days. I promise though, I'm not trying to sneak off off of safari. Wendy's been fine mechanically and then all of a sudden, all those Impala, once we started the car and we carried on driving, she's making a shuddering noise and I've opened up the hood of the car and it's very, very, very hot inside there. Well, I don't, I don't know what it is because the fan belt's still going around and around. Um, oh, an Impala running across the road. I'm not really sure. So I've got Opa's number. I, I, Opa's our mechanic, by the way. I hope he... Oh, maybe he's not here. It's a, no, there's no such thing as a Sunday when you work in the bush. So... <coughs> First, we're going to get rid of that sneeze. Woo, that gave me goosebumps. Thank you. Um, and we're just slowly making our way back to camp. I seem to be losing power. 
So like, my foot's quite far down on the accelerator, not really going anywhere anymore. So we're just going to hope that we make it home. We're not too far away. Um, so I'll have a little look. Woo. Now, as we drive along, hopefully we'll be able to hear what Daniel has uh, just been talking about. And that is, can another line as well... Uh, Identify, uh, identify, identify another line from its raw. The answer to that is yep, yes, yes, yes. They can indeed. Um, I suppose we might not be able to hear the difference all the time, but sometimes with lines you can hear. Um, well, they've got different pitches at which they they roar. So just like I don't sound the same as David, David doesn't sound the same as me. Each lion roar will be unique, and of course lions can understand one another. We can't understand them. So they will indeed be able to tell the difference. Um, remember, that's how lions try and find one another. Uh, if a coalition, say the Birmingham boys have all split up and one is looking for the other, he might do a big roar to try and locate his, uh, his fellow coalition members. Or the same thing with Nguhuma Pride, for example. If any of the lionesses, they get separated. They often start with contact calls if they think they're close by. But if they are a little bit further away, they might end up doing a roar. And then, obviously, the rest will reply. And then that's how they'll find one another, which is quite cool, I think. And like I said, sometimes you can hear it, especially with the male lions. And if you get to hear them roar often enough, you'll be able to, no be able to notice the different types of roars. Like one of the four ways males, which is uh, two boys that lived at Sabi Sabi for a little bit. They then moved on, though. They went into Kruger. And then when the Charleston males arrived, and uh, the one male with very orange eyes had the deepest roar I've ever heard in my entire life. It was so cool. It was the gruffest roar of any lion. It was amazing. And he wasn't a particularly big boy either, but he, <laughs> listen, what he lacked in size, he made up in, uh, in his roar. It was really quite cool, in fact. So, so yeah, that's quite nice. Yeah, I haven't heard a lion roar. We hear them obviously for a distance, but I haven't had a lion roar right next to my car since I've been back in SA. That would be a lovely treat. That really would. <coughs> and shoo, must be, excuse me, must be all the grass. <laughs> now, I'll chat as long as I can. We're going to be pulling into the workshop shortly. So one last question from Katya. And that is, have I had any close calls with any of the animals? Yeah, oh, I have. I've had, my most recent one was with an elephant. In fact, an elephant cow on, on Chitwa Chitwa. Looking at this breeding herd and then this cow sort of came out and she didn't look very happy. We were so far away. The next minute she just ran and she pushed a whole tree down to try and get to us. I reversed so quickly. David, were you with me again for that? Again, 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 again. David was on the car with me. So yeah, that wasn't fun. Um, it, I mean, it wasn't a close, close call. I moved away, but if I think if I stayed put and I didn't start the car and drive away, I would have been in a lot of trouble. She would have moved me. Um, hippos I've had close calls with on foot. I have also had a close call with buffalo on foot before, a buffalo. That was a lot of fun outside the tent. And then also, with elephant bulls in must that I didn't necessarily know were in must or I was trapped. I got trapped by breeding her on a forested road once when I first started guiding. That was terrifying. Right, I'm going to send you to Tristan who's probably walking around here somewhere. If I look carefully enough, I could see him. I'm going to very quickly open the hood of my car and see what's going on with it. But off you go to Tristan. that folks I was um, on the phone again just um, with the guys making sure that everyone stays away from that area um, with the general manager of Juma uh, he just wanted an update so I was just giving him a quick update so I'm back and uh, hopefully Taylor gets her tech fixed quickly and so does Tristan now I'm hoping that Hosanna is somewhere in this area I nearly said quarantine you know that you know that's a blast from the past have you 
Because uh, how many times we've had quarantine here? Sure. At least 25, 30 with VM alone. So I, I just sort of, and I haven't been on Juma for, for quite a while, so I almost said, quarantine. It'd be nice. No, it wouldn't actually be very bad for how the leopard dynamics of quarantine arrived. But uh, this is the area where we heard those kudo alarm calling. So we've just been sitting quietly and listening. And unfortunately, we haven't heard any more alarm calls. So I'm going to check down a little bit further towards Inyala Road South, north. And um, the Ellies are down in there, and we're going to keep clear of that area for now. It is absolutely sweltering today. It's a good thing. One of the most important things when you're out in the bush and it's very hot, uh, to make sure you drink enough water. It, it's not uncommon that we'll drink two to three liters of, a water, of water in one drive, especially at this when it's this, this temperature. I mean, it's 36 degrees Celsius. I must say, I'm quite impressed with myself. I was on the phone to Jamie after drive this morning, and I said, today's gonna be a stinker. I think it's gonna get to 35 degrees. And it was 36, so not too far off. Now, what I'm also trying to do is find the kudu. This is another good spot. Let's actually just get down into the shade. Let's have a look around here. Now, of course, it's beautiful and green at the moment, but in a few months, it's going to be quite brown and, and gray. And uh, it's our fire season. CNAC is asking about wildfires and do we ever get them? We do occasionally. And uh, we also have controlled fires. We do controlled burns in this area. Uh, a lot of people think fire is bad. It's another one of those massive misconceptions because fire is good. Most of sub-Saharan Africa outside of the forest block, um, which is obviously the Congo Basin rainforests and the rainforests in West Africa, is what you call a fire climax biome. And what that means is a lot of species, particularly the grass, needs the fire. Um, to climax and that means it will destroy and bur burn all the moribund dead grasses dead seeds um, it helps enrich the soil and so after fire with a little bit of rain you get incredible growth incredibly quickly and uh, most of our trees out here are fire resistant or fire retardant so they don't actually get damaged that much and even the small animals like tortoises uh, mice and rats and and uh, those type of things, the vast majority are able to get into the bottom of a thicket of something like a gwari, which is fire retardant, uh, and survive the, the, the fire. So fire is actually a very good thing. Traditionally in Africa, um, in this type of area, those wildfires would have been started by lightning during the dry season or uh, right at the beginning of the wet season, and they could have burned many thousands upon hundreds of thousands of hectares uh, these days because of people we control them so uh, most uh, depending on the type of soil type of grass most areas are most effective if burnt once every two to three years so you'll have different areas that you cordon off and burn um, every two to three years and what that does oh, more elephants Ellie's Ellie's everywhere um, and what that does is create a very healthy ecosystem um, with the right balance between trees and bushes and grasses. Okay, now he seems to be heading up Nyala Road North. So I think let's do that. There might be some eddies heading towards Buffalo's Hook Dam. And we can sit there and listen. And we should still be close enough that if we do hear alarm calls again, we should be able to dash into this area. While we're going through here, Paula is wondering about species of evergreen trees. This is one here. Um, the Tamburti tree is an evergreen tree. And you see if I rip the leaf like that, 
it'll start bleeding a milky latex. Now that milky latex is highly poisonous and can burn one's skin. But Tumbertis are evergreen. We've got lots of evergreen trees actually. Well, not, the vast majority are not. The vast majority are deciduous. Uh, but ever, evergreen trees. Uh, we've got another one right here in the African ebony or the jackalberry. There's another evergreen tree. Um, and uh, it's only one or two acacias are evergreen, and such as the brackthorn, which is also here. Most of your evergreen trees will grow around these little riverbeds. Sorry, Vimpy, the brackthorn is all the way behind you. Um, quarry bushes. So yes, we have a fair number of evergreen trees. Oh, I apologize, that is not a brackthorn. Is it? Just zoom in on the thorns again? I apologize, it's just a very green Dicrostachus, uh, or sickle bush. Um, so a lot of our trees and bushes are evergreen. One of the most important ones in terms of animals, due to its palatability, is the Zizifus, or buffalo thorn. This has got to be very careful. Oh, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. So this is a very important evergreen tree. Um, and during the winter months, it's not so important during the summer months, but during the winter months, you'll actually see a browse line where Impala, Bushbuck, Inyala, and Kudu will feed on it extensively as well as elephants. So that is the buffalo thorn. And uh, it's got the most wonderful Afrikaans name. It is a Blink Blar Vachabikibos, or Vachabikiboem. Yeah? That's what I'm correct, yes? So it's called a waiter bit, which it translates to a waiter bit bush or tree. Now, the thing is, is because if you ever get stuck in it, you have to wait a bit to get out. So not only will it impale you on a very sharp, straight thorn, it will hook you with a very nasty hooked thorn on the underneath. Now, of course, if you're very popular at being eaten, you need all the defenses you can get. Now, not only is it popular amongst animals, but it actually goes very well in salads. Especially when they're nice and fresh and green like that. Now, apologies at the moment that uh, I'm the only feed. There are tech issues with both Tristan and Taylor. Taylor is asking me if I'm live. Hey, firm Taylor. Um, so. I'm the only feed at the moment, so it could be a while. Um, okay, so we're going to try head towards Buffelsock Waterhole, see if the Ellie's are going to go for a swim. Ah, red back shrike sitting nice and high perched, eating as many insects as possible before the long flight home, well, back towards Europe. Uh, redback shrikes that have been ringed in South Africa have been re-caught in bird nets in England, can you believe? So they'll be taking advantage, especially after that little bit of rain we had, uh, of eating as much, as many insects as possible before their long flight back towards Europe. They're very pretty birds. Now, certain birds will shed feathers from time to time, um, and that is called molting. And First Lady is asking, why on earth would they do that? Well, those feathers become damaged, um, will affect their flight patterns and whatnot. So they're constantly getting new feathers, and that's why they take a lot of effort in grooming and keeping those feathers in pristine condition. Now, it's very important if you are something like a redback shrike who has to fly that incredible distance all the way back to Europe for the summer. So they spend European summers in summer and African summers here. So they just live in summer permanently. Now we heard those kudu alarm calling quite a while ago. So it's not impossible that Hasana might have even got this far. So always a good spot to check.
This is still definitely one of my favorite roads on Juma. In Yala Road North as we meander up the little river system that comes out of Buffalo Sock Dam. Okay, I just want to check here on the soft sand. No, no sign of Hosanna coming this way. Now, of course, after the rain, there's been a bit of an explosion in insects, uh, but not so much in flowers. James was asking about baboon's tail. Uh, have they started flowering after the rain? No, James, and they're very unlikely to. They, are normally, they normally flower with the first rains, not the last rains. So their flowering season is well and truly over. It's very unusual to find any baboon's tails flowering this late in the in the, in the in the season. Okay, and fortunately, guys. So, although we are stable and here in present, uh, Conrad is running around like an absolute man mad trying to fix Bushwalk and Wendy. But to do that, he has to reboot our whole system, which means you're going to lose us as well. I will give you a little bit of a warning before that happens. Uh, but it, in the next little while, there's a possibility you're going to have to go into Tech Loop. We will be back. Hopefully, it won't be to me. Hopefully, we'll have Taylor and Tristan back as well. If it's just me, we will soldier on, don't you worry.